Well, welcome. This would usually be our Friday morning men's fellowship when we used to gather in the Le Center in Westlake, Ohio. But since COVID, we've not had that uh, opportunity. But we're very grateful that we can do these video interviews. And uh, we're very blessed by Grace Church here in Middleburg Heights to provide all this assistance, professional assistance to, to videotape. So today, we have a very special guest, a regular at the Friday morning uh, men's fellowship, uh, Dan McDonough. Dan, welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and ministry, which you're going to My tell pleasure. us about. So I'm uh, very happy to have you here. And would you open us in a word of prayer, Dan? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, King of Kings, Creator of all of us, thank you for this day and thank you for this opportunity to meet here at Grace Church to talk about you, to share our stories a little bit. I pray that you speak through us to whomever it is that you want to hear this lead us and uh, we strive to glorify you not ourselves in the name of jesus we pray amen thanks dan so as i said this uh, opportunity to have interviews every week has been a tremendous blessing uh, to kind of keep the group together virtually and we really appreciate these uh, interviews where men have been coming in and sharing their testimony their life story how they came to accept jesus christ how that's transformed their life and of course, I've known you for many years, Dan, but would you kind of share a little about your own life and uh, sure. you know, how you came to where you're at today? Absolutely, and thank you for, thank you for having me, John. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a, uh, on the west side of Cleveland in Fairview Park, Ohio. Um, four brothers, no sisters. We were Catholic, we were happy. We had a, I was very lucky, I had a, a great family. We went to church. Um, I was I was bored with church, frankly. I didn't I didn't get a lot out of it. I went because uh, I believed in God. I believed in hell. I was afraid of hell, mm. and um, my father made me go to church. But it, it, to me, it was a um, it was a, it was a boring hour that I didn't get a heck of a lot out of. I knew I was missing something, but I had no idea what. Um, but if you'd have asked me, am I going to go to heaven? Do I believe in heaven? The answer is yes. And am I going to go? Yes. And if you said, why are you going to go, Dan? I would have said, because I'm a good person and, and God's loving and, and it just makes sense. I, I, I didn't have any more articulate of an answer than that. And I didn't understand, uh, I didn't even understand what Jesus did in order to create the opportunity for me to go to heaven. So mm -hmm. that's the way it went. And then when I was 14 years old, in the summer, our house caught on fire in the middle of the night. Mm. And um, as we all scrambled to, to, to get out and to, to save each other, um, my mother uh, never did make it out and she was killed in the fire. And my youngest brother, who was six years old, Toby died in the fire, and my oldest brother, Mark, who was 16, was burned very badly, over 70% of his body, um, very serious burns, and spent many, many months in the Metro burn unit. And he even had an afterlife, after-death experience where he, he went to heaven. He was actually um, dead on the operating table at, at one point on August 13th, but recovered from that. And he has a, a very magnanimous story about, about that day and about that event. But the, the tragedy tore our family apart. It didn't tear us apart from each other. It just, it was such a disruption. It was so tragic and I had just, just turned 14 and I was just, lost and there were a lot of people coming around trying to help us trying to distract us um, very well meaning and there was a lot of um, alcohol involved at the parental level and, and they would all say you can have a beer Danny it's okay and and that late summer I discovered I wasn't quite as sad when I had a little bit of a buzz going from beer um, now and you're 14 years old at the time. Yeah, barely. What, what year one was week. That again? I mean, was that was yeah, it was 1976. That was a big news. That was, was all over 
Cleveland, that, that, that fire because it, of the family. It came. was. So, um, so as sad as I was, I had these temporary moments of um, peace because I had a little bit of a buzz going on. So it was, um, it was just more manageable. And what I didn't realize was I was learning how to self-medicate, and that went on into the fall. When I started, I was going into my senior year of high school, I failed every single class my first quarter in high school. I was just so glazed over and so disengaged. I feel like I was still in shock at that point. But, but whenever I could, I would drink a little bit. I was discovering pot and some other minor drugs, and it was a great escape. And I didn't know how much damage I was doing to myself at the time and how much I was dependent upon that. I remember being very, very, very sad. And it's this very particular moment, not long after the fire, I, I, I can still picture myself in the exact chair I was sitting in when I said to myself, I'll, I will never be happy again, and I will never smile again. Mm -hmm. And I meant it. And I, I thought it was disrespectful to be happy again, and, and I was just so crushed anyway, I, I couldn't see an avenue to be happy again. And I just thought this is going to be the way it, it'll go for the rest of my life. This is, this is it. And so that went on for a, a couple of years. Um, and I, I didn't smile for a couple of years. And I mean, I had no idea how convicting that kind of a decision or statement to myself psychologically could have on me. I, I, I was a very unhappy, very sad person. And one day, <clears throat> I'm, I'm in the park across the street from my house with a bunch of guys, and we're, we're really not up to any good. We're mm -hmm. listening to music, throwing a frisbee around, drinking beer. It's the middle of the summer. And I noticed this guy about 50 yards away sitting with his wife and his two children on a picnic blanket. And then I noticed a little while later that he was walking towards us, and I remember thinking, He's probably coming over to tell us he called the police and we, it's time for us to get out of here. But that's not what he said. He was very gentle, I remember that. And he said, hey guys, you mind if I talk to you for a minute? Have any of you read this book? And he had a Bible in his hand. And I listened to him and he told a story about, about his life and how well he was doing at a time with his business and that he had lost it all. His house was foreclosed on. He didn't have any food and his son went out to get wood, it was winter, because that's how they were heating their house in the fireplace, about to have their house literally taken away. And there was money frozen to the log that, this, that the son brought in. And it was, a, it was a great story, but what I remember most is that he said, God wants to help you, and God will help you if you ask him. God can fix you. And that resonated with me, because I knew I was broken. I, I knew it, and that got my attention right away. And he said, listen, when you go home tonight and you're staring at the ceiling all by yourself and there's nobody around, reach out and just say, God, if you're there, help me. I want your help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember him even saying, you know, I'm not even sure if you're real, but if you're real, I want your help. Please help me. And I believed him when he said it. I mean, it, it, I was convicted of that. Even walking home, I had a little bit of a spring in my step. I remember this. I was excited, and I, I wasn't even waiting until I got home. I was kind of saying the prayer, and I was kind of saying to myself, I'm going to say this prayer yeah. as soon as I go to bed tonight, yeah. even though I was saying it at the time. And <clears throat> what's amazing is, now at that very moment, I, I felt better, but I wouldn't say that trumpets blew or angels visited or anything like that, but I did feel a little bit of relief. But then my life began to change dramatically, and it was almost just a matter of months when all of a sudden I said to myself, oh my gosh, look what has happened. Mm. Because my grades turned around immediately. I was all A's and a couple of B's. I, my hair was way down past my shoulders. Mm -hmm. I was hanging around with people that were doing what I wanted to do, which was sure. drink and get high. And I went back to my, to my old friends. I just started seeing everything differently. And 
and I wanted something else, and I was smiling again, and um, and I started to set my sight on future, on college, on things like that. My attitude was completely different. All the teachers were saying things. Police in Fairview Park were saying things. The mayor said something to me. So to um, recap, <laughs> to look back, I mean, the tragedy that you experienced as a family, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, people are going through difficulty now with COVID season and sure. sickness and even death. But to lose your mother, you lost your little brother, mm -hmm. your older brother is badly burned, and is, I, met, I know the long just, months and years yeah. of, of, of uh, rehab and plastic yeah. surgery and all this, and then to go into this valley of grief and really depression mm -hmm. where you sought uh, alcohol or something to help just get through that, and now you come to this spot, and you, what are you, 17 now, 18 years old? Six, 16, pushing, 16. Okay, Solid okay, 16, continue. Yeah. I just wanted to yeah. kind of recap that, that's amazing. I mean, it was good. It, the real, real change was occurring the summer between junior and senior year. Okay. So going into my senior year, I was a completely different person than when I left my junior year. And if you look at the two pictures of me, the people who don't know me, they would go, that's you, These, this is, it, it was that different, yeah, it was unbelievable. And um, I just, I just, I had a new conviction. I, I now I was certain I was going to heaven. It wasn't just a maybe I'm going to go to heaven. And I had no doubt whatsoever that God was real and that this was a real thing. But that's as far as it kind of went for me. I, I didn't understand that God wanted a relationship with me. I didn't know what that meant. I, okay. I didn't know anything about this about part two, which is what have you been saved for and what does it mean? Mm -hmm. I was, my perspective was God is a great God who is there to help me. So when I need help, I'm gonna call on him. Okay. And that's what I did. All right, got it, got it. <laughs> so I had an agenda and when I needed help with it, I would call him and ask him to help me with it. It didn't even occur to me that he has an agenda. <laughs> that's uh, good. Yeah. And uh, sadly, embarrassingly, it would be decades before I figured that out. So I, I went on living my life, I was, I was praying all the time at night before I went to bed, mm -hmm. not throughout the day. There wasn't any continuous um, pray without ceasing. There wasn't any continuous contact. There wasn't, um, but I would, I would say thank you at night and I would have a list of stuff that I needed help with, that sort of thing. And that was as far as it went. Um, and then much later in my mid thirties, I just started, to get, when I started to have children, mm -hmm. it really dawned on me that I don't understand what this is all about, okay. even though I believe in it. So I started to, to study, and that was when I met you, and mm -hmm. that was when my eyes opened for the first time into somewhat of an understanding that, that I never had before, and that kind of got me on fire. Then I, then I chased it mm -hmm. um, and was very interested in it, but, but I still didn't, um, I still didn't understand something that came to me again much later, which was why in the world, <clears throat> other than the fact that he loves us, why did he save us? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it occurred to me, if it was simply to get us into heaven to spend eternity with him, why didn't I just die the moment I was saved? Mm -hmm. Why am I still here? And then, that, that opened my eyes to a different perspective and I started to think about all the Old Testament saints and um, these guys were heroes. These guys, these guys subjected themselves to torture, to whippings, to stonings, to, to, to terrible, painful deaths, all for our sake, all so that they could bring us what is now our canonized Bible, so that they could write those letters, so that they could tell that story. Right. Why? So we'd hear it. Mm -hmm. So then I started to see everywhere in the Bible where it says, that's what you're supposed to be doing. That's why you're here. So that started to gnaw at me. And I, and I was thinking, well, if they did it, and if, and if God did it with his own son, either one of two things has to be true. Either about 10% of us are supposed to go do that and the rest of us just get a free ride, mm. or we're all supposed to go do it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't deny, I couldn't, I couldn't 
I couldn't rationalize that I'm not supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. I tried. Service, you mean yes. reaching out to others? Yeah, so, so that gnawed on me. So I kept saying, well, when are you gonna do that, Dan? When are you gonna, when are you gonna jump in with both feet? What are you waiting for? If you're not gonna do it now, when do you think you're gonna do it? Mm -hmm. So I had a passion for prison ministry because I'd heard on a radio program years before about a, uh, an inmate who was wrapping up a bar of soap and toilet paper for his daughter who was coming to visit mm -hmm. because that's all he had. And that story really touched me and I started to get involved with an organization called Prison Fellowship and Angel Tree where the purpose is to bring gifts to incarcerated men and women's children. Right. So, you know, everybody knows about the con convicts, about the prisoners, but there's always, there's always a wake of children that, that we sometimes forget about. Yeah. So that started to, that, that lit the flame of my interest in, in prison ministry. Mm -hmm. So when I came to the realization that God is talking to all of us, I had to make a decision. I'm either going to live in denial and pretend like he's not talking to me, mm -hmm. which I just couldn't do, or I'm going to commit. And, and the more I volunteered with prison ministry, at this point now I'm going into prisons and I'm working one-on-one -on -one with prisoners and in groups with prisoners, the more I did that, the less interested I was in my my career. Which was, was what at that I, time? I was senior vice president of the largest brokerage firm in the world. In the world? In the okay. world. And we had 60,000 employees. Mm. And, and I, w I, I was losing interest in it. My, my fire was gone for that, but my fire for hmm. prison ministry was, Interesting. was yeah. growing like crazy. And it, it, was, it was diluting, it was, it was covering this, this commercial insurance business that I was in. And I, I, I said, I, I think I'm supposed to do this full time. I don't even want to be in insurance anymore anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not fair to my employer because I'm kind of flying at half mast right. here. I don't really care about it. So I went in and said, I'm leaving, and I'm, I'm getting out of the insurance industry, and, and goodbye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I started to look for a full-time prison ministry. I had been volunteering for three different ministries, prison fellowship, an organization called Kairos, and uh -huh. another one called Bill Glass, Behind the Walls. Oh, he's big. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So I started to look for a full-time um, rescue ministry. I, I, I was interested in prisons, but any any ministry that stops the generational madness where mm -hmm. where you can you know that the the problem is this trickle down effect when incarcerated men and women go away the kids suffer but right. but there are many other <clears throat> ministries where children are suffering and if you can stop it so that it doesn't trickle down to the next generation you've you've cured that column of mm -hmm. th that family and it doesn't go to the next generation so that's what was so attractive about prison ministry. If we, can, if we can change the perspective of this prisoner, not only will we keep him from returning, mm -hmm. but we will keep his children from following in their father's or their mother's footsteps. Two out of every three prisoners in the United States return to prison within three years. Right. And I thought, that's just crazy. It doesn't have to be that way. And it's that way because they didn't have the benefit of learning what I had the benefit of learning. They don't have the benefit of the perspective that I have. But when you, when you explain it to them, when you talk to them, when they see it, two fantastic things happen. There's a transformation in them where they now view the world differently. Their worldview is changing. You mean as you share the gospel yes, with them? Yes, yes. And, and, and when they come to believe, they're like, wait a minute all this stuff I did was forgivable? Mm. And of course it's forgivable. The only, I say the only difference between the two of us is you're on that side yeah, of the right. gate and I'm on this yeah. side of the gate. From God's perspective, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. Mm -hmm. You know what, that, that's it. And, um, and it's, it's tragic because so many guys I meet, I'll say, do you believe in heaven and hell? They'll say yes. And I'll say, and if you die before you go to bed tonight, where are you gonna go? And they'll say hell, and they mean it. Oh. And, What's, 
what's um, what's so joyous is when that same person comes to understand they don't have to go to hell. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> not only do they not have to go, but God wants them to go to heaven. Sure. And I can say, God, you and I both have to be in heaven. God wants you in heaven. God wants me in heaven. He wants all of us in heaven. And um, for many, that's that's eye-opening, and it changes them. And then now you can focus on, okay, let's keep my kids from doing this. Okay. Let's save my children also. The next generation. So, so do you go into a lot of the jails and prisons in Northeast Ohio in this ministry now? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and you're, this is actually a career for you now. This is a position yeah. you have. That's amazing. It is. I, I call it a way of life. It, it, it really is because it's, um, you know, you, you do it all the time. I mean, my, my phone rings often and through the weekend and stuff because right? now with COVID, what's interesting is we, we can't get into the prisons. We, okay. haven't, we haven't been in since the middle of March. We have been able to stream, live stream um, into groups. Bible studies. Yes. Or these, okay. Yep. But so what we did is we changed our, we, we shifted our focus to once they walk through the gates. So now we're grabbing them on their way to the halfway houses, at the halfway houses, and as they leave the halfway houses. So we, um, we, we try to teach them a, a new perspective, and we, um, we assist them with all of the hurdles that they face that keeps them from getting a good wage-paying job that, okay. they, that can sustain them. That's it. And, um, and setting up their life so that they don't, they don't have to go back. So f we pay for things like um, apprenticeships. Um, mm -hmm. Commercial driving is a really popular career right now because you can, you can become a Class A commercial driver in five weeks and you can make $60,000 a year. Okay. And that's life changing for these guys and they can, they can live on that. So you can do spiritual? back. The spiritual help through sharing the gospel Bible mm -hmm. classes to fortify their faith, and then you offer practical yes. training, uh, links to jobs. So, what have you seen over the years in terms of uh, response or receptivity of prisoners? What What is your sense of it, Dan? Go on. Um, they, I think it's I think it's more receptive now than it was a short time ago. Um, there's still a great there's still a great deal that we miss. I, I say it's easy to get the low-hanging fruit, which mm -hmm. are the people that, that know they have a problem, that, that want some kind of help. They're worried about their future. They have thoughts of God and heaven and afterlife and mm -hmm. what happens next. But there's a vast economy of guys that are much more difficult to reach. We'll go into prisons with um, what we call um, platform guests, famous people. Um, sports figures, right. mm -hmm. musicians, to get their attention. And you've always got about a quarter of them that, that are right up there with you, mm -hmm. and you have a chance to talk to them, but you've got three quarters of them who don't really want to talk to you. Yeah. And some of that is, uh, is volitional, but some of it is they're worried about what everybody else thinks. They're worried about protecting what they perceive to be a reputation that they need, which is I'm not weak, and, and I don't want anybody to think so I started a ministry that is designed to get a message to those guys through some different format. So through audio and through video. So that if they're sitting in their cell and there's nobody looking, like right. I was when that guy said, when you go home tonight and there's nobody looking, yeah, you right. say a prayer to God. If out of boredom, boredom or secrecy, I don't care, if I can get them to listen to some really compelling Bible lessons that How? explain it to them. How would they listen? With a, through a, um, an audio device is the way I started it, with headphones. It's solar powered. It has an auto Bible, audio Bible on it, and it has 200 lessons that just walk from Genesis to Revelation you can, a half an hour at a time. They can have that in a cell? Well, some can and some can't. However, what what's helping us tremendously now is there's something in the system already in the prisons where there, um, many of them are using tablets. It's kind of like a an iPad, okay. if you will, where they do things on that iPad that they used to do on paper, like 
manage their manage their um, commissary or control their phone list or their visitor list or oh. request an appointment with a physician, things sure, like that. Sure. So we are working now to get all of this stuff on that system. Nice. So um, if we can pull this off, we'll be we'll be in thousands of prisons in an instant. How many of the devices do you have now until you come to that next system? Um, I, I, I'm not literally in possession of that many because I'm getting resistance in some prisons to, to allow that device oh, I in. I see, okay. Um, which is okay because of that, uh, that, that, better. that other system. Mm -hmm. That's so, good. So that's what we're Very innovative. We're focusing yeah, on. I like so we have, a, we have a lot of content, a lot of video, a lot of audio. And, and if they can hear it and the light will go off or they'll go, oh, that's what that means. Because a lot of these guys, they're getting, they're getting a King James version of the Bible the day they go into prison and they're, they're stressed out. And if they read it, they kind of glaze over because right. it's a little hard to follow. But sure. if, you can give them, if you can give them something that makes sense, that piques their interest, and, you, and because of that, they say, you know what, I'll listen to another one. You get a few of those in, and as you know, it's a great story <laughs> yeah, <laughs> once right. you understand it, right. and it's it's hard to put down. So, do you need volunteers, or how do people they can get in touch with you, or if they're it, interested in going into the prisons? Ab absolutely, in in all of the prison ministries that I work with, they they're all volunteer based. There's one that I'm on staff with that isn't volunteer based, but we still. Um, we still seek volunteers. So, is there a website that they, people can go to? Um, what I what I would go to is um, it's called the Ridge Project dot com, mm -hmm. and then also if you would like to, you can email me. It's it's Dan dot M C D like the first three letters of my last name M C D C D mm -hmm. at Hotmail. Okay, easy enough. And, I'm just thinking some people to, might be watching to reach this out to them. that are interested because. I mean, you went through an incredible tragedy, you know, and the way you've come through this, how it's been redemptive in your own life. You met the Lord, you accepted Jesus Christ, you grew, and then your brother Mark, mm. who I know very well, the same yeah. thing was transformational, coming through this incredible tragedy that affected the family. And today he's serving as a plastic surgeon, helping yeah. so many people and sharing the gospel in that capacity. Yeah, so but we do appreciate you coming today, Dan. I know you got a bit. Right after this, you're going downtown to teach Bible, right? Right, yeah. Into a prison. In Not a, to a prison, in a halfway but it's a halfway house. Yeah. house. Okay. Yeah. Well, God bless you, Dan. Thank and, you. Uh, before we close, I just want to pray for you and your ministry and that God keeps uh, using you, you know, and using your gifts and opening more locked doors in the prison so you can get in and share the good news of the gospel. And they would Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, and we thank you for this tremendous opportunity that uh, Grace Church here in Middleburg Heights provides for us. Just bless the staff here. And I ask a special blessing upon Dan, and uh, I thank you for his testimony, his life's journey, the difficulty, the tragedy, the sadness, but how you redeemed him, how you pulled him up and, and it restored him and gave him a brand new life and a purpose for living. And now he's reaching out to those that are hurting and going through very difficult times in jails and prisons in Northeast Ohio. I pray, Lord, that you would bless Dan, open doors, give him favor, and bless and prepare the hearts of many prisoners and people that are being released and in these halfway homes that he, they can hear the good news of the gospel. And then they can also hear Dan's testimony and how you brought him through this very difficult time in his life. And you can do the same for them by the grace of God. So again, Lord, we thank you uh, for today. I ask a special blessing upon Dan uh, and Mark, his brother, that they can continue to be a blessing to many. And we pray all of these things for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank Thanks, you. Dan. I thank appreciate you. it. My pleasure.